everybody it's uh it's 6 30 and uh we're uh we're here for a, a, a public information uh meeting and thank you all for coming it's a good turnout and as john was saying we sometimes don't have this many people here for our budget meeting so uh this is a good topic to come up we have two representatives of sebago technics to present for us uh nikki Connor and bradley lyon and uh they're going to be uh be, be going through um their thoughts at this point in time, but basically what we're doing is trying to get some some feedback and you know, a sounding board so that we can uh, they can be armed to address kind of what the what the public's thinking about this project. So uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll allow them to go through their presentation uh, completely without any questions. Just to allow them to speak, and uh, and then and once they're completed, uh, we'll turn it to the council and staff. And if there's any questions that way, we can. Uh, we can ask those questions or, or make a comment ourselves. And then at that point in time, we'll turn it to the public. And what we'd like you to do is to come up to the uh, podium. Uh, we have a, a device called OWL, and it, uh, it's got a video and audio pickup, and you'll be able to be recorded, but it, it needs to be at the podium. So please come to the podium and be recognized by the chair. Our, our council chair, Mallory Cook, is has other uh, business tonight, she can't attend, she apologizes. So I'll be running the meeting. And uh, so, uh, like I said, please be brief. And uh, we'd like to try and keep questions and comments to, to two minutes. Um, if it was a regular public hearing for ordinance and something like that, we'd, we'd, have, we'd put you on the timer. Hopefully we can keep it brief. We won't have to go with the timer, uh, but uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out. What we'll do is we'll go through the audience one time Everybody get a chance to, to speak, that's fair. So there's not someone coming up two and three times to uh, speak or question before the others have a chance to speak. And then we'll go a second round uh, and you, know, you have a chance for follow-up. And generally speaking, that kind of covers it, but there might be something that is informed to the public on a third round that you, you might not have thought of, but might have come up and through another question. So we, we can, we can uh, open it up for a third round. But generally that's down to, we're getting down to threes and foursies at that point in time. So uh, I think, Tim, I think that covers it all, doesn't it? Uh, yep. Can you guys think of anything else? <coughs> okay, so if you could please rise, pledge allegiance, uh, we'll start the meeting that way. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, and justice for all. One other uh, thing that I think about it, uh, we don't want to get into a, a give and take back and forth amongst the audience or to audience to staff or council. So if you have a question, please address it to the chair and then we'll find the best appropriate answer uh, to, to get your, your question answered or at least recorded because we, we don't have all the answers tonight. We, like again, we want to hear from you folks. So with that, I'll uh, introduce Nikki and Bradley and start your, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, John. Everyone can see this, all right. Uh, like John noted, I'm Nikki Conant. I'm a senior transportation engineer and project manager with Sebago Technics. With me tonight is Brad Lyon, who is our vice president of transportation engineering. So this evening, we're gonna kind of give a little bit of the project history, um, some of our proposed scope and process, and then really open it up, as John noted, to public input. We really wanna get feedback from everyone uh, regarding this section of Route 236, which I'll show you on the next slide. So basically, our scope of work is looking at, well, you can't see my mouse, unfortunately, in this. Um, real quick. 
we're basically looking at this roadway down highway through Main Street to Portland Road off to the right. So that's kind of our scope that we're looking at. Um, so we'll be looking for feedback as to what works, what doesn't work for you all within that section of road. The timeline of our project, basically we kicked the meeting off in August with town staff. And we also presented the project to the council uh, through September through December, we've done some data collection. So we've done um, some turning movement counts, which is basically counting the vehicles on the roadway. We've com completed that. Um, we're working through some of the traffic analysis, but we haven't gotten too far with that because we wanna hear public input before we, we start getting to um, some significant analysis. And then we'll be working on the report development. So here we are in October, holding the public meeting to solicit feedback from you all. And then ultimately in January, we'll look to submit a final report for the town. Some of the goals that came up in our initial kickoff meeting with the town uh, were to basically update this previous traffic study that we had done for the town of Seth Berwick. Sebago Technics had actually completed a pretty robust traffic study on Route 236 back about 10 years ago. Um, there were a number of things that we looked at at that time and nothing really got implemented. So what we're looking to do is basically relook at that study, but also new information that we have today and try to understand what we can do to update this downtown area. Anyway. So one of the other goals was looking at considerations for both vehicles and pedestrians, as well as reviewing some access management strategies. And I'll speak to a little bit more what exactly the definition of access management is. And so to best solicit feedback from you all, um, we're going to kind of throw out a number of different considerations that we look at when we're looking at redeveloping roadways. Uh, one of the terms that we use, especially on main DOT projects and when we're just looking at corridors as a whole is called complete streets. And you'll see that definition to uh, the left of the screen in this orange box. Uh, the complete streets policy intends to ensure safe and efficient access to the street and highway system for users of passenger, commercial vehicles, transit riders, bicyclists, and pedestrians for people of all ages and abilities to use the transportation mode. Really, in summary, what this means is how can we reallocate the space for vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, all sorts of different users while keeping in mind what your priorities are. Um, in some instances, it might be on street parking, streetscaping, like street trees and benches and things of that nature, or maybe speed reduction strategies. Uh, so that's what we're looking to kind of solicit feedback from you all. And what are your priorities for this section of road? You all drive this road, you walk this road every day. What is it that you would like to see in this area? Um, especially in these downtown areas, we're really kind of defined by limitations where you have buildings on one side of the road and other sorts of um, restrictions. So we only have so much kind of space to play with. So we want to hear from you what your priorities are. And I'll kind of go through uh, this list you see on the right. Is it vehicular mobility, pedestrian accommodations, on-street parking, bicycle facilities, streetscaping, like I mentioned, landscaping and maybe pedestrian scale lighting? Um, or do you feel that there's a strong need for traffic calming efforts? And what can we mix and match to get the most out of this corridor? So when we talk about vehicular mobility, we're looking at opportunities for traffic signalization, uh, roundabouts, or turn lanes, for example. How can we apply these different uh, design elements to intersections to either make them more safe uh, make movements more convenient and efficient, things of that nature. And then when we look at vehicular mobility as well, we also talk about access management, which I noted earlier. Um, and I really like this diagram to the right. It kind of shows exactly what access management means in a nutshell. Uh, when you're looking at a section of roadway and you have a number of different driveways for different businesses and residents and things of that nature, the more driveways you have, the more conflict points you're going to experience, whether that's between a vehicle and a pedestrian, two vehicles, um, a vehicle and a bicycle, there's just more conflict points when you have more driveways. So when we look at access management, we're trying to reduce the number of those conflict points. And you can kind of see that in the diagram to the left where there's multiple driveways, um, and a number of different conflict points 
And then the photo on the right shows just one driveway and how the conflict points have been reduced. We also look for uh, pedestrian accommodations. So currently Main Street has a sidewalk on both sides of the road. Uh, in front of the businesses, the sidewalk is really wide. Um, when we're looking at redesigning efforts, it's do we retain that type of width for the sidewalk? Um, we can go basically down to five feet of sidewalk width or wider, depending on what your needs are for the corridor. Um, we look at updating pedestrian accommodations to Americans with Disabilities Act, which provides uh, accommodations for detectable warning fields. So basically panels that allow for a visually impaired person to locate where a crosswalk may be across the roadway. Uh, and we also look at things like uh, the photo on the left you can see is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. So basically what happens with these is there's a push button that's actuated by a person. Uh, the signage will light up, providing more attention for a vehicle to see that there's someone waiting in the crosswalk. So these are all the types of things that we look for and look to when we're um, redesigning a roadway corridor. On street parking, which is something that Main Street currently has, um, we look when we're looking at allocating space for parking between seven and a half feet to nine feet. Um, and also as we start to implement things like traffic signals and crosswalks, we have to keep in mind how parking plays into that. Um, Main DOT, for example, has standards where you can't have parking within 20 feet of a crosswalk, uh, within 25 feet of an intersection and 10 feet from entrances. So when we would look to redo this corridor, we would be looking as those things are implemented, how that impacts parking. So we're definitely really interested to hear how um, parking works in the downtown area, uh, what you like, what you don't like, things like if there's opportunities for timed parking spaces, um, like timing limitations, time of day, uh, if there's a need for loading zones in the downtown for local businesses. These are all types, the types of things that we're looking to hopefully hear from you all. Bicycle facilities are another option. These are um, a couple of photos from projects that Spago has done where we've implemented uh, either dedicated bike lanes, which take up a certain amount of space, or putting the bicycles within the travel lane and providing signage and roadway striping and things of that nature. And then uh, opportunities for traffic calming. If we believe that there's a need for slowing speeds along the corridor, some of the things that we've done are looking at kind of raised median islands, which you can see on the photo to the left um, at that crosswalk location. We've also looked at reducing the widths of travel lanes, um, which is actually something that we also did on the project to the left. Um, or the photo on the right shows curb extensions with those uh, RRFBs, those flashing signs that I showed you before. So we can look at different things like that in terms of reallocating space to provide um, more visualization to crosswalks and provide traffic calming throughout the corridor. And then as I mentioned previously, streetscaping. So that generally includes lighting, um, landscaping, other types of features that might be a priority to be located through the corridor. Um, those tend to be more of like beautification type aspects. So again, it's all what you have space for and what you're all looking for out of this section of roadway. So we wanted to give you a bunch of different things that we generally look at when we're looking at a corridor right from the start without any sort of um, plans just to let you all speak to what might be priorities for you. So with that, um, I will give it back to John to open the, the public comment piece. Thank you all in advance. Uh, any any questions from uh, staff at this time? Okay, you give your hand up, um, Jessica. Thank you, um, Nikki. Could you just clarify how far down to thirty six the zone is for um, consideration? So we've basically collected data. Um, I wish my mouse could like circle where it is. Yeah. No, it's not. Is it as far as Vine Street or Academy Street? Yes, yeah, so it includes Academy Street. Yep, so there we go. So that's the start. That's Dow Highway. 
that intersection where basically the two lower lines intersect. And then if you move down 236, it includes Academy Street. We collected data at the school accesses. Um, you. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm trying to control what you're talking. No, we're not too long. Let's see. So if you scroll down, it includes this intersection of Portland Road, uh, Paul Street, and then we collected data as far as uh, Young Street. Yeah, so just to clarify on the data collection, they were 12 hour turn and movement counts. So it counted um, both vehicles and pedestrians at those locations. Did you mention the school as well? Yep. Yeah, yeah. If I could uh, follow yours. I, I believe the question was how far down the Dow Highway to it, because Academy Street dumps out gotcha. opposite Pine Street, further, further to the activity side of the school. Yeah, so our focus is more so on Main Street. So we would be looking at the intersections that come into Main Street. So would it be fair to say just just beyond Cumberland Farms? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then extending to Young Street, the intersection of the Right. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions of council? John, you have anything? All set. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Comment that I would have is that, you know, is in, in my time here, um, it, it's, we've always, you know, we, we struggle to maintain a, a livable, walkable downtown. And uh, we've strived to support the downtown in various ways, like, <clears throat> like buying the Catholic church to make a library out of it, uh, doing the deal with the best of housing, so that we have those 28 units that are going to support the downtown and uh, we we have historic properties downtown and uh, so we, we have this nice blend uh, of of mixed use you know between professional offices restaurants banks uh, and etc you know the historic properties i mentioned and and so we're trying to keep our uh, one use from overwhelming the other. And I think the sense here is that vehicular traffic with increased traffic counts, two state highways moving through town are starting to dominate. So that it, it's uh, it's upsetting uh, that, that, that balance between the mixed use zone, which is B1, uh, which, which was Carter and, Carter and Tails, and, uh, and allowing the, uh, the downtown to function. Mm -hmm. So we don't create a... Uh, uh, you know, a, a sideline desert uh, because people are, you know, we're, we're doing okay right now, but you know, the trend looks like it's it's getting busier and busier. So what do we do? Uh, we're being forced to uh, uh, through population, the last census, to to engage in urban compact the state. So that's coming, and uh, so that that's where we are. So I'm I'm very keen on the complete streets model. But particularly from a pedestrian focus, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see that because we have 100 years of transportation engineers who have thought about basically one thing: moving things at four wheels as quickly as possible to the next stoplight. <laughs> and sorry for the criticism, but, but uh, no, it's true. And, and, and so now we have to think about other things. We have to think about you know people on bikes. We have to think about uh, people on, on foot, and it's, it's part of the overall uh, attraction of our downtown. The Eastern Trail will come through. Uh, we've been members of that for many years, and unfortunately, it's a north to south type of thing. But we're also trying to attract those people who might want to get off the trail, yeah. come down downtown, have a sandwich or a pizza or something like that. Yeah. So it increased the the, uh, the profile of our downtown, so people can come and enjoy it as well as we do. Uh, the other piece is the sidewalk widths. Our sidewalks have grown organically, and it works off the model. This is a dimension that no one will ever see written down in the book. But whether you're cliff size or my size uh, or Nikki's size, we all take two and a half feet. That's why sidewalks are five feet wide, so two people can go side by side. So the case in point would be the sidewalk in front of Central School. That that worked. We had a, a narrower sidewalk, and what happened? People walked on the grass all the yeah. way across the front, so we added the extra width. So that that was just like you could actually snap a string line to see how wide it needed to be based on on use. It's not a bad way to go, but so I just want to be careful about that because at certain times of the day, 
the furthest store fronts, uh, we're, we're quite busy, you know, with like, you know, four people uh, passing each other uh, going through the, that. Uh, thing. And then, then we have the other part, which is the problem of the utility poles back as far as 1966, people were trying to connive a way to get it out on the ground, but that hasn't happened. But that, that would be a, a big solution as well if we could do that. So that, that's my piece. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, if no one else up front here has a, a question or a comment, we'll open it up to the public. Cliff, just come up and identify yourself and uh, state your address. Cliff Clary, Hens Plains Hill. The biggest concern I have is to allow the parking in front of the businesses. And it's planned on the Pickway parking on the streets. One of my biggest issues. I don't want to see them lock the doors. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Erin Morgan. I live on Garland Street. <clears throat> um, Garland Street is on Route 4 towards New Hampshire. We're one of the first streets in. Um, taking a left out of Dow Highway at any time of day, I have put my car in park at that intersection before. Um, I think the two lanes that have been created where folks can go right has helped, but taking a left out of there um, during any like high traffic time of day is difficult. I've seen a bunch of accidents there too. And second, um, we walk around a lot <clears throat> from our place over to the historic district and people coming from downtown down the down four are flying a lot of the time. Um, and so sometimes we park our car on the street there because we've got limited parking in our driveway. Um, and we just, when we're crossing the street, people are really flying around the curve. And sometimes it's difficult to be seen as a pedestrian. I know that that part isn't it, but slowing people down up here that helps out. Mm -hmm. My name is Robert Levins. I'm a relatively new resident of South Berwick. We moved here about three and a half years ago, four years ago. Uh, a couple of things <clears throat> that I think I find perhaps as somebody who hasn't been here a whole long length of time is I see that corridor as being lacking some continuity, let's just let me say visually, such that uh, I think that if something could be done visually to make it a cohesive way it would help the image of the town as a place that you want to be and be in and come back to just, just and it might help calm the traffic a little bit as well. My, uh, secondly, I, I wonder what the ownership uh, is of the way, because some, in some instances it might not be clear and I don't know how clear it is or not, but that's something that I think needs to be looked into if, if it hasn't been. That's all, because it may impact what you can. These are state highways. So, you know, these are state highways. Yeah, main, main department. So they're, 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 they have state highway layouts. <clears throat> well, physical layouts that you can go see in a map. Well, we're dealing that's my, with that's my question. I yeah, guess. we're dealing with the community that was incorporated in 1814. And so, you know, the, the center of town has moved in that time from, you know, Vine Street or actually Brattle Street down to the right. Vine Street and Liberty Lib right. Street and, that's, and slowly that's moved my, with the churches. That's that's part of my question. Yeah. yeah. So our, our town center moved, you know, again, uh, down in, in Cliff's neighborhood. The point uh, that was a, a viable downtown as well when the railroads were in business. Right. So it, it, it's a movable thing, okay. and uh, so I think the state has done its best mm -hmm. to try and deal with that because, as many places were built in the 19th century, they were right next to the road. So that's a limiting factor right there in terms of what could be done right. in terms right. of right. Uh, of uh, so. changes in, in from wagons to. Uh, the, the, the semi trail. Just one more simple point, if I may. I know I can come back later, but 
Um, I was wondering if any thought had been taken into um, the possibility of charging stations, that if people come and want to charge their cars, they may stay and use the businesses. That's all. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Dave Benelli. I live at 175 Portland Street, right up by the uh, first house break after the new development they just put in. And I can tell you, those trucks come down through there at 15, 60 miles an hour. And there's a sign up there that says, Jake breaks only when necessary. Why can't the town put a sign up that says, no Jake breaks allowed? Because if they were doing the speed limit, they wouldn't need them. There's many signs in many small towns in Maine that don't allow Jake breaks. It's a problem. And uh, a Jake break is a short name for Jacob's brake system, which is a standard uh, piece of equipment, safety equipment, if you will, with that cutout that allows the compression of the engine to slow down the vehicle. And so if you get into a legal situation when you, when you state that you can't have a piece of otherwise safety equipment, even though it's onerous and they all make Blah, 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 noise. Uh, and we all know what it is, but it's but that, that's the that's the problem. I mean, I, I've seen science throughout the state, traveling through the state, no, no, no gate breaks allowed in many towns. How do they get it, it's, it's, a, it's a legal question. Yeah. I, I've lived there for uh, 33 years. And two truck rollovers, one including a death, yep. and another, another vehicle down and crashed into my neighbor's house. I back out, I back out of my driveway. <coughs> I don't see any cars coming. And next thing you know, I got squealing brakes behind me. They say, come on. That is the only section coming into the South Berwick anywhere that's 35 miles an hour. Every other piece of road that comes into this town is 25. Why can't that 35 mile an hour speed limit be changed to 25? And the 45 up above that in Berwick changed to 35. <coughs> Somebody else is going to get killed. Hey, thank you. Oh. My name is Robert Chemis. I live over at 19 Park Street, which is right across from Garden Street. Robert, could you spell your last name for me, please? G-E-M-A-S. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so I'm a mail carrier, and I used to work in traffic control and selling and servicing traffic lights. I drive a lot. <clears throat> Every direction coming into this town is a nightmare. Everybody speeds. Putting up signage isn't doing anything to stop people. I got passed in front of the police station at six in the morning in the pouring rain by a pickup truck going to the yard. And I was going to like they just flew around in the oncoming lanes, not passing it. But uh, I think with so many three-way intersections in town, the only way to safety, the only way to make it safer is to make the vehicles able to move through here in a safe way. That I think that will make it safer for walking, bicycles, and vehicles. The staggering number of fatalities on Route 4 in Rollinsford is ridiculous. Um, so yes, turning left out of my house over on Park Street from Liberty can be a nightmare between the people speeding from town and the people speeding from Rollinsford. Um, yeah, I don't see any way to not have traffic lights, especially at rush hours. Um, that's going to eat parking spaces. But the other thing is, like right out in front here, where you have this Y intersection, if you can go left and right heading north, um, everybody parking on that side of the road, everyone going south has to shoot around them, getting in and out of their cars which then they're over the line. They're over the double yellow. And if you're going left, 
you have traffic in your lane coming towards you, and then the possibility of traffic on your right turning right, which is a bad situation. Uh, that's that's what I think. Safety. Move the cars through, and, and everybody else will be safer. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mike Mandola, 16 York Ridge Road, which of course is Route 91. Uh, the first thing I was thinking is because this town, I've been a resident for about 35 years, and business business profile in the town has changed. Right out's hardware is gone, um, and we have one market, which is this market here. But it's mostly restaurants now and places which people will come to and sit for a while or walk in front of for a while or take out Chinese place. So should we consider thinking about centralized parking that's within walking distance from the downtown area and then taking away mo all of, or most of the parking spots in front of these businesses, which will facilitate traffic going through town and again give ample parking and space for bicycles and stuff to visit while they park in the main area. The second thing is traffic lights. And that wasn't part of the discussion that I saw here, but I know it's been brought up many times in the past, traffic lights, especially in Route 4 and 236 and coming down 236 and Route 4 past Cumberland Farms. That area, I don't think anything can be done with the major congestion that goes through that area. It's only gonna increase. So I think traffic lights should be considered. Now I know my last comment is I live on Route 91 and that's a major intersection sort of between where Route 91 MPC and 236. And I know they're doing some work there now. Is that a traffic light that's going in now? Because I know that was discussed. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Hi. 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 I'm Julie Neely, 175 Portland Street. I think that's the first thing there. Julie, sorry. Julie. Um, my question is, how has the York toll increase changed the volume of traffic that we have running through town? Um, I have a feeling that we're seeing more traffic because <clears throat> York toll is $5 for a car. I'm hearing $20 for trucks. So a lot of traffic is coming off um, from Wells going through our town. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, I know that's more of a state issue, but um, why can't, I know we lost money, the, the state lost revenue money because of, of COVID and we didn't have the volume of traffic coming through. So that's why the tools were increased. Is there a way the state can more fairly up, increase, make more revenue by increasing tools in other places? You know, because I'm wondering how, how much volume of traffic should a town our size be expecting to handle. Uh, we don't have that information. Perhaps uh, I don't know if there's anything that you folks know intuitively or past projects about what's happened with the turnpike and its effect on bypassing on the, the two lanes. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't have any tangible numbers in front of me tonight. Um, I will say some of the data collection that we did back in September will draw to light some of the traffic issues that are currently present because we've got historical traffic count. So when we go through that, we'll be able to compare this year's data to two years ago and be able to say, whatever it is, there's a 10, 15, 20% increase. Why there would be an increase, certainly some of that would be uh, related to the Oracle Plaza. Um, but again, I, I, you know, without digging into it more, I don't have those numbers right offhand, but it certainly is a valid point. I think without a doubt, you, you're probably are seeing some increased traffic due to that. Um, how much so, I, I'm, I'm not prepared to say tonight. The other reason is this. This is the biggest reason you're seeing an increase off the highway. Oh, they, the programs? Everybody, everybody yeah, puts it in. Yeah. As soon as there's a backup, Hooper Sands is, well, I can tell when the highway's backed up because Hooper Sands turns into a highway with everybody jumping off to get down on the 236 or going across Bell Marsh. So, and I use it, everybody's guilty of it. Mm -hmm. But I think we're seeing a lot of that because you look at the plates coming through. Yeah. The extra buck on a toll, I'll pay the extra buck on a toll to be able to go 70 down, down 95. I'm going to pay it. But I think a lot of it is because they see that backup almost in wells. And this is telling you 22 minutes quicker, so they're going. I, I think that's a big piece of it right now. Okay, we have a question over here. Yeah. 
Hmm? I speak. Oh, uh, I should tell me that you want to talk. So, folks, let me give you a little bit of background and stuff, kind of to, to jump off what Julie was talking about. So, when I first got here, I, I you know, I get, I get ten to twenty-five traffic complaints every week. Um, <clears throat> I try to address every one of them. But one of the things we looked at when my presentation to the council to get Sebago techniques here, when we found out that we had a report from 2010, a study that the town had spent a fair amount of money for, that we hadn't acted upon any of the results. <clears throat> we started looking, me and my staff got together and we had a meeting. We talked about the future of tomorrow for Salt Burke and the quality of life that we want here. Quality of life, when I'm getting all those traffic complaints from all of you, and I get them, and I, I, I hear you. I went to the council and said, we've got to do a traffic study. I'm not, I'm not a traffic engineer. I won't lie to you. I play one on TV, but, <laughs> <laughs> but here's what we need to think about, okay? Is traffic increased in South Burke? Absolutely. Has traffic increased in South Burke because of all the new buildings that they built in Burke? Think about this. In 1984, South Burke had a, re a resident population was about 1,500. Today, it's, our population is 8,000. Think that through for me, okay? We've grown that much. Well, if we've grown, do you think Burroughs grown? What about Sanford? Is Sanford grown? Sanford just got a $34 million DOT grant today for the revitalization of the downtown district. What's gonna happen with all that traffic? And all the traffic of these people who wanna to go to the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard and everywhere else are coming. And then Julie, exactly your point, coming off the turnpike, let there be an accident at the toll booth on a Saturday and people don't get home till Monday. You know, it takes that long to get through back that traffic. My concern is when we talk about this, you folks have to understand, we're looking at the future. If we don't do something right now, if we don't stop, and 10 years from now, after I'm retired and gone, you're gonna be mad as a Dickens at me saying, he didn't do anything when in fact I tried. The point is we've got to recognize the fact that South Berwick is impacted not only because of South Berwick, but because of Berwick, North Berwick, Sanford, and all these other towns. That's what I need to study to tell us, Julia, points well taken, thank you. We recognize, myself and the council, I truly recognize we've got a problem. But if you are not aware, we've been studying this problem here in South Berwick since 1987. So it's kind of time to do something different because as we all know, the definition of insanity is not doing anything and, and same result. So the council has been very progressive on getting this study together with the idea is that we hope we want to hear from as many of you as we can to get as much information into the study. The more information in the study, the more information we'll be able to get results out to you to tell you what these professionals think will help us with our traffic. Failure to do that and to ostracize our approach by putting our heads in the sand and our butts in the air will only result in a lot worse problems 10 years from now. So we've got to do something. That's the purpose of where we're starting today with this committee. I just want you to hear the background. Thank you. Okay, Tamara. <laughs> Could you tell me what, what hours the traffic study was done, just out of curiosity? Yeah, so those intersections that we talked about, uh, we collected data from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we wanted to capture the commute to the shipyard, the school, as well as the commute home. So I, I guess my personal feeling is that traffic calming measures should be a priority because as a pedestrian, I rarely, I rarely go downtown because the traffic is so bad. And I occasionally am a pedestrian down there and it's scary to try to cross the street and there's a lot of speeders. Um, so I think that, and unfortunately, if it means losing some parking, I think I would be willing to do that rather than being struck by a car. Um, and I know there are other places we can park and maybe that could be part of the plan that someone else suggested. Okay, thank you. Yes. 
<laughs> you should just come up and stand behind me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ellen Breed. I live on Liberty Street. And I want to thank you for putting the uh, tables on our street. It has um, definitely had an effect. Some people are angry driving through with having to slow down. They call me poorly. I'm sure. <laughs> but um, it has really, the, the calming effect in general has been beneficial to life on the streets. And when Pete, when you're walking or you see children, you've already been warned because you're driving on the street that something's coming or that something could be there. So they're more apt to uh, not be as surprised by seeing a child or a dog or a walker. Um, I've just had a few thoughts. I think calming traffic based on what we've experienced on Liberty Street has been very beneficial. Um, so doing that in the downtown would be helpful because I agree it, is, it can be frightening sometimes to try to cross the street. We just crossed tonight with the blinking light here across from Central School and it worked great. I mean, you just push that button, the lights start flashing, people slow down. It's very noticeable. The fact that it's not on all the time, but it happens when somebody's there is, been, is very helpful. I Maybe you crossed in front of me. I couldn't see you guys, but I saw the light. <laughs> Maybe more of those in the immediate downtown across from Nature's Way, across by the intersection of Portland. Maybe that would help slow people down when you try to cross there. That's a tough intersection. Um, I, I was thinking about the sidewalk um, next to the Jewett House on that side of the road. That's not a well used um, sidewalk because there's nothing over there. Maybe we could push some parked cars there and put one of those bump outs into the um, crosswalk because you'd have a little more room there that maybe would impede the traffic coming into town that wants to turn right down 236 towards North Berwick or to, towards Berwick. But um, I have just a couple of ideas for thinking because I do think calming is important because we do want the downtown to be a place that people want to go and have a slice of pizza, but also you want traffic to move through. So maybe a three-way roundabout at the end of 236 and Route 4 so that people would know that they're going to be able to go at some point <laughs> instead of coming down Liberty Street because they know they can never take a left. Um, that's it. Thanks, Ellen. Good yep. to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I probably screamed by the podium or whatever, but anyway, come on down. I sat in a bad spot. <laughs> My name is Alan Buffard. I live at 109 Portland Street, have for 35 years. And is that with a B L B O U B O U double F A R D? Uh, I've lived there for 35 years, and as I listen to the the uh, traffic uh, study uh, thoughts, I I see a lot of those things already in place in this town. Maybe a few more some places, uh, but I think our current problem is traffic and. Uh, you know, whether that's people going to work and, and, and he hit the nail on the head, you know, Sanford, how do you get to Sanford, the, the you know, Kittery, the shipyard, down 230, uh, Route 4, 236. Uh, if I lived in uh, Berwick, North Berwick. So this is this is the only way to get here and then made it in the state road. So that's, that's the right road to be on too. That's not back roads or anything. Uh, so, you know, I, I live at 109 Portland Street, which is about halfway across the street from Highland Avenue. And some days and some and, and during the weekends, even when there's vacation, some people at the lakes and places like that coming home. Um, you know, the traffic's back up past my house and it's very hard to get out. But I think our biggest problem is, is, is we do have a bigger volume of traffic, we gotta figure out how to move that traffic. And then the, one of the problems that we don't have is traffic control. When there's a policeman, out there once in a while on busy weekends and things like that, they'll put a policeman at the, at the crosswalk. He controls the traffic, so he moves the traffic uh, in a northerly fashion. What we have now is stop signs, and and uh, for the for instance, uh, Route Four and Two Thirty Six come together in the center of town. Uh, there's a stop sign. Well, I'll start at the beginning. Two Thirty Six comes to Route Four at Cumberland Farms. There's a stop sign for people on Two Thirty Six, but not one for people on Route 4, which is, I mean, that makes sense. You shouldn't have stop signs everywhere because that's kind of, <clears throat> but if there was a traffic light there, you'd move a volume of traffic through and then and stop traffic and then, and then you, the light would switch. You could also coordinate that with a pedestrian device that would give time for people to cross over because those blinking lights that people talk about, you push the button, 
They work great. Uh, I, 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 you know, I know everybody hates trucks. I happen to have owned trucking companies all my life, and I'm a truck driver myself. Uh, the trouble with it's everybody thinks that the trucks are, uh, you know, trying to escape the tolls uh, or, or the scales on on the, on the main turnpike. A very little bit of that is true. Most of it is not true. Uh, it's there's a lot of trucking activity in Sanford. All the sand for all the construction companies in this area comes from Sanford. So if you're coming from Sanford, you're going to come down uh, Route Four. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, you know, Poland Springs is, is up there. That's that's the way to we want to get to the Poland Springs distribution warehouse. There's uh, in, in Wells. There's uh, uh, and probably most of those trucks do get on the turnpike. Some of them probably don't, and that's you know that's that's a fair choice. But I don't think it's a financial is it? as some of these own trucks. I don't think it's a financial uh, savings to get off and take a couple of bucks of toll. Uh, it could take a lot longer to do this route. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the things that I don't think any of us can legislate or fix is common currency. Yeah, exactly. yeah. People absolutely will not let you out of your driveway. I back into my driveway every day because I know I'll have a fighting chance of getting out in the morning. But if you don't have, if you, if you, if you try and back out into traffic, you know, it's, a, it's a nightmare. And, and that's just people that think that if they're gonna, their lives will be better if they're in front of you as opposed to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when I look at the current conditions, you know, we have great sidewalks. I walk my dog up and down the street every single night, and we have great lighting. We have good sidewalks, wide sidewalks. And I think that the businesses now, we have a, you know, this is not a, uh, this, is a this is a wonderful town. I've lived here for 35 years, and I can't imagine moving. But I think that uh, the businesses here can be a little bit fragile. They have to be easy to access, and I think that they need to keep that parking. Now, if you lost the parking, maybe you'd have some extra traffic lanes, but then those traffic lanes would be right on the edge of the sidewalk, and I can see that. Uh, when, you're on the, when you're on the sidewalk and everybody's roaring through Route 236 going to uh, uh, Berwick, you got a little buffer at somebody's car, but if, if they're right on the edge of the sidewalk, you're going to have cars close to the sidewalk. Uh, I don't know that we can afford, I'm not trying to solve all the problems and I'm not the professional, so forgive me. <laughs> I'm going to say my two cents and I'm going to shut up for the rest of the meeting. Uh, you know, we, I don't know if we can afford to have a lot of bike lights on that major road. I think that people want to ride their bikes, maybe they should take some of the parallel roads and we could suggest that by bike lanes and bike routes down those roads. It, it may be the kind of thing that people haven't thought about. Our sidewalks are pretty much ample. A lot of times people can ride their bikes on the sidewalk, although I know that doesn't really uh, work perfectly with pedestrians, but you know, the kids are always on the sidewalk, better on the sidewalk than the road, in my opinion. But, uh, so I think we need some parking, but it, and my solution would be would be traffic lights. And I've heard that traffic lights are a problem because you have to lose all your parking because of the some regulation that says that they have to have no parking within 25 feet or 50 feet of road traffic light, and I don't know if that's a rumor or true, but you know, the, the, the biggest problem we have, we had a cop out there 24 hours a day, uh, you'd have traffic flow would be a lot better and, and the anger levels and the courtesy levels would probably reduce because it gets it's very frustrating. I'm always actually proud and come up 2.36 at 3.30 at, uh, in the afternoon that, that vehicles have decided themselves that we're gonna have two lanes. If you're going to turn right, they all get into the breakdown lane and everybody lines up. And if you go into Dover, then you stay in the left lane. And actually, sometimes when they stop there, you want to go into Cumberland Farms or get out of Cumberland Farms, people let you go. So they kind of team up on those efforts. But I think that if we had traffic control, and it can't be a human being, but if you had traffic control lights, and you, if those lights, you could also incorporate a pedestrian walkway with a, with a timer for that, you'd be able to move 15 to 20 cars on a light. And people would feel they were getting some progress as opposed to if you're at if you're at uh, Route Four and it, 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 uh, at a Portland Street Route Four and and two thirty six crosses that going to Berwick. If you're there, it's with you. You have to check traffic this way, traffic that way, and there's always some guys trying to speed up and close the gap so that you can't get out. Uh, maybe they just got out of gas. 
<laughs> but it, but it's, it's a very difficult thing. A traffic light, in my opinion, fix it. And I, and I, we're going on seven minutes now. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, this is a twenty minute. <laughs> All right, I'll get down. But that's, that's my thought. Like that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's my thought. Thank you. Um, if I'm not ignoring anybody over here, I, I'll go. <clears throat> yes, sir. Hi, my name is Mark Aon. I live on Brattle Street in the summer. Um, I've only got three points. First, uh, I was interested in noting that uh, Sebago Techniques did not appear to have considered the traffic on Norton Street. I think that uh, a lot of people use Norton Street as a way around the intersection, yes. and uh, that should be considered, especially for the residents there. Yes. Uh, secondly, um, I, lived at, I lived in Auburn for a real long time, and I can tell you that uh, roundabouts are really good solution uh, up by the uh, the Auburn Mall and, and between Auburn Mall and, and Walmart and such. They have a roundabout and uh, really works very very well. Traffic keeps moving. Um, you go around the circle and it, it just works really well. And if there's enough room, that that'll be something to, to seriously uh, consider, uh, rather than the traffic light, which um, by its nature runs all the time and there's a lot of times when you don't need it um and and third my third point is is personal beef and that has nothing to do with this actually except it does relate to route 236 and that's the intersection of Brattle street route, route 236. um that's posted at uh, 35 miles an hour um i challenge anyone to find anybody who's going 35 miles an hour at that intersection right in front of the police station but most people are going 45 to 50 miles an hour try to get out of Brattle street and when you do and when i do um you have to floor it and people behind you coming up 236 are very upset with the fact that you've cut them off you really don't have any choice because they are going too fast if they were going 35 miles an hour you could get out of there safely and you would not uh, you, you know, you would not have to floor the, floor the car just to get out of your street. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, blue. My name is Christine Hudson. I live at 87 Pond Road. Um, one of the things that kind of struck me is that data wasn't collected during the summer. And I, and I think one of the things that can be highlighted in both within your day and within your seasons, there's a wide range of what happens in downtown. You can, you know, that's one of my frustrations sometimes like, okay, is it gonna take me five minutes today or is it gonna take me 20 minutes today? And so I hope that solutions that are looked at can offer some flexibility in, in how, offer flexibility in the, Range in time usages. Sorry, and uh, and also it was said. I'm one of the guilty parties that will go through the neighborhoods periodically, and I think that really needs to be looked at. That your, the traffic impacts the neighborhoods beyond this, as when people try and get around things. And if you put in, you know, how will light, how will where the lights are placed affect? Surrounding neighborhoods and streets. So that's just my input for things you guys to look at. Quickie off a of route four has been suggested to us before to make them one ways because that would stop a lot of what you had. You can't it, you make a one way going down into Norton, mm -hmm. off of Portland. Mm -hmm. It would stop a lot of people from going down and taking the left to get back out into downtown. Yeah, it would solve a lot of those issues. But again, that's that's yeah. for the professionals, not me. But <laughs> One ways would help. Yeah, and you know, as a traffic participant, you're looking for how can I help move traffic. That's why that's why I do it sometimes. I do try to avoid it though, because I recognize it's a neighborhood. I think we all cheat. We do. I cheat. Anyone else? Uh, before you do a follow up, yes. I'd like to go around and get everybody yes. first. Yeah. My name is uh, <clears throat> Mike Spinney. I live at 35 Sewell Road. Um, and I walk this neighborhood probably at least five times per week from 
sewer down Main to Young Street down to Parrot. And um, I would, you're soliciting public, public input. And I would just like to say that uh, my priority would be um, to speed reduction. Um, there's some pretty dangerous spots out here on Main Street, walking down the sidewalks, especially with my dog. Um, and the other, the other thing I'd like to see, as a result of the study, is to make make it a focus where uh, downtown is thought of more as a destination for at least the local people. Um, it's it's a nice place. It's a nice place to walk around. And I'd like to see it safer and uh, more inviting. Uh, last question that I do have is, um, could you guys explain what the deliverables are from, from the um, contract when this is, when the study is done? So they, they're to look at the traffic flow and there's four, I think there's five of them that they were to look at to you know, give us traffic flow amounts, traffic flow recommendations, pedestrian recommendations for the sidewalks. Um, Solutions, vehicle and pedestrian flow, your U access management strategy, and then um, implementation strategies of what, what that could be and how to implement them on a timeline. Okay, so they will they will come back with recommendations. I'm hoping they will because I'm not signed up to do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> if I was, we would have had to pay for them, but I'm not that involved. I just need to pray out. So, and I think you made maybe the most important point is that um, if it's not more painful to go this way from Sanford and Berwick, and then they're going to keep coming this way. Well, one of the things I don't know if you know, but the old mill in Berwick. They're, re, they're repurposing that and they're building a 200 unit apartment building there. Yeah. Think that through for a minute. And if 100 of those people have to come here, to come down through here and then go home again, just, just from them, never mind how much we've grown in our time and we're going to continue to grow, it all affects and impacts your quality of life. And if these five people, and myself and my staff, don't address this, it's never going to get better. So this is the start of us trying to fix the problem. The best I can tell you is we recognize it exists. Hopefully someday we can get it fixed for you. Oh, thank you for looking at so Just a quick follow-up on the deliverables, which you asked for. <clears throat> 10 years ago, they gave us great deliverables. Okay. Nothing was ever done with the deliverables. So is it finances or any reason for that? Or? Will? <laughs> Will. Okay. Well, in 1985, we hired another engineer, T.Y. Lynn Associates, and we did the Powder House Hill land use study, which called for a bypass going from, well, Farmgate Road, where the police station is right now. The reason that's so wide is that that was actually built as an arterial, and it was going to go around the backside of Powder House, cross Agamenicus, and go over the golf courses, which in those days was an industrial park. Right. Uh, so, but there was no will uh, to, to implement it at that time. So, um, and that happens with changes of administration, changes of, uh, of political all the time. Well, it, we probably have limited options now. Well, the real estate's gone away. And on that point, um, uh, everybody here is probably old enough to remember paper uh, highway maps. And, uh, <laughs> and, and the, the urban areas on the, on the, on the highway maps were, were colored yellow. And so what we have here at South Berwick we have a big blob of yellow to the southwest, you know, northern northeastern Massachusetts coming up through. We have a big blob of yellow, Manchester, directly to our west. We have a big blob of yellow in Portland, and those are all growing. So mm -hmm. South Berwick right now is in the crosshairs. So uh, what we do now might be our best shot to, to, to get this and make it happen. But it's gonna take will. Potholes and speed bumps. <laughs> <laughs> you guys wrote it for the road bond. That's all I'm going to say. We took care of the bond. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Dennis Wormel. I live at um, 30 Borough Road, South Burke, Maine. How do you spell your last name, Dennis? W O R M E L. Thank you. And I, um, 
So I live on 236 heading towards Kerwick. They did a study. I don't know how many, it's, they did the sidewalks from like Main Street to the railroad tracks. And they did a study. How many vehicles actually go through that intersection are those two intersections during that period of time that you said you studied? That's what we're trying to get to. We haven't got I thought you already had the number. No, no, we don't have the numbers yet. Because they went back when, I don't know, that's was probably five or six years ago. <clears throat> the study was that going by my house was like 8,000 cars through that time frame mm -hmm. when they were doing it. So now I'm thinking it's got to be way over that. And what intersection are we talking about? I'm on 236. Right, but what intersection were you interested in the traffic count on? Um, the the uh, Portland Street and 236. Because when they did the study okay. back, back when they put the sidewalks in, they were going to go from the railroad tracks and put the sidewalks in and resurface the road all the way to 236. They were going to do the whole big study. Do, they did nothing. They did. They lowered the hill in front of my house nine inches raised the bottom of the hill nine inches to flatten out the hill that was there. And they put the sidewalks in from um, High Street all the way up to Main Street. Yeah. And then they were going to do more stuff going down towards downtown um, uh, Route 4 and 236. They never did it. Okay. I suggested to them back five, six years, eight, eight years ago, I don't know how, what the study was, to try to stop cars coming, I guess that would be west on Route 236 and taking that left on the Route 4 and try to incorporate um, Norton Street, which is, I know that's, you just said that you're trying to eliminate all the, all the stuff that they, they decided, and I brought that up back then too, and they said the same thing. No, but um, trying to change just the flow, make, make, maybe making it one way street. So you, so you can't turn left onto um, 236. I mean, onto Route 4 from 236 or downtown at Route 4. You the understand? Middle of town. Middle of town. The middle of town. Down it, it does stop a lot of traffic. If you're on Portland Street, Route 4, and, and you finally, after you wait in line for oh, someone five minutes, it could be 20 minutes, depending on the time oh, of day. But once you finally get to the intersection, it's your turn to turn. Lo and behold, somebody's coming down 236 and they, they want to take a lot. Yeah. You have to stop. Yeah. And next thing you know, here comes 10 more. And they want to take a lot. And they want to take a lot heading towards Sanford on their four. Yeah. If you're going to kind of eliminate that and make that so, and then you could take in from like the Norton Street. Up to that, in, up to that, and in, basically in a section, you could probably add parking from the post office and all that. You get that big, you get that parking lot there. You might be able to, I'm not sure how many cars you would add or not. You can make that a parking lot. So people coming from Fairwick and North Fairwick would have to kind of drive mm -hmm. through that, through that to keep going straight, but they wouldn't be able to take a left onto Route 4. So it's just a suggestion. Okay. You guys do what you want with it, but um, I, I would be really interested in the number of vehicles that actually flow through town every day because that's a freaking, I know it's a number. Well, when the report's done, Dennis, it'll become public for the, all the citizens right. that they have and see. I'll make it, we'll make it public to the council and then we'll make it public to, the, to all you folks because we need your support to fund any projects yeah. to make the changes that you guys hopefully are suggesting that we can put out. Yeah, no, no problem. It's just my my input. Okay, you and then Rick. I'm Dave Stebbins. Uh, we live at 110 Main Street with my wife and I. Uh, we've been there about four years. Um, <clears throat> living in Elliott and uh, Kittery and known the South Berwick towns for a long, long time. I would think that the calming down of traffic seems to be a huge concern from a lot of people that we've talked to. Um, I have an elderly neighbor on one side of me and she likes to walk to church and back and get her PT exercise walking past the house. I've seen kids try to, uh, we're just like three houses down 
and George Rollins for um, around the corner from South, from uh, Cumberland Farm, excuse me, in the, in the church. Watching kids, junior high, high school kids try to cross the crosswalk uh, by the big green old house um, and make that crosswalk to go to Cumbies and get something, somebody's gonna get killed. I'm just, I, I just know that that's gonna happen. They're on skateboards, they're all great kids, but we've seen two big accidents in front of our house uh, less than a year ago at a car come down from like Dunkin' Donuts around that corner, missed the corner, bounced off the guardrails and flipped over right into our driveway and came six feet from uh, the front of our house. Uh, how the guy didn't get killed is beyond me. About a year and a half or two ago, a, a motorcyclist coming from Rollinsford, coming into town, going over a hundred and missed the corner and how that guy's not dead is beyond me and ended up crashing in the second church um, right across from um, Dunkin' Donuts. It's just the speed is absolutely friggin' ridiculous. And I'd like to see something coming from Rollinsford into town like you have now coming from the golf course um, into town that flashes. That's been a huge, that we did. just, we put it yep. up there. and that seems to be helping. I know I come from Biddeford every day from, from school teaching that way, and those lights really mean a lot. I think we need the same thing from Rollinsford down by the Cumberland Farms by the, the bridge. There is one there. We just put it in. Okay. There's a brand new one right there. Same thing as what's Okay. Before. I haven't gone past there the last couple of days, yeah. but maybe even signs that say congested area, dangerous intersection, something to slow these GD people down. And I don't think it's anybody in this room. And, and as much as is, I hate to say this, it, it's common courtesy, as somebody else said. And I think it's a lot of young, young drivers too that just think I can just go as fast as I want. I see people peel out all the time, come down 236, they take a left to go towards Rollinsburg. And I, I tell my wife, pardon the expression, it's goddamn NASCAR. Mm -hmm. It is, it's NASCAR every time. I can be out mowing my lawn. I put my hands up, like seriously, you were just at the intersection and you're going like 40 right now. It's a congested area. I, I worry about my elderly neighbor, like I said, God forbid, but I'm going to find her on the side of the road sometime. I just know that that's going to happen. It's really, we got to calm traffic down. Hey, Dave, nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Been been many years. Years, so, been a lot of years, but yeah. love the town. That's why we moved here. Um, if we could just calm people down, it's just yeah. ridiculous. So, thank, thank you for you. listening. Okay, Rick. Rick Becker, at the intersection of 236 and uh, Main Street, and I agree with what was just said about the uh, acceleration of the vehicles uh, heading towards, from the intersection, heading towards Rollins, but uh, as he said, they, they peel out and go that way, uh, and the other one is uh, when they get, they probably, people are frustrated uh, when they come through town, and boy, when they hit 236, and they see Kittery and some open road it's, uh, in between that and section of Vine Street. They, uh, they're not obeying the speed limit. In regards to the flow of traffic in South Berwick, uh, my feeling is the only solution is something similar or exactly what Jack said is a bypass. It's, we try to, you just, the people coming through town is just going to get worse and worse and worse. And the only way to uh, alleviate the amount of traffic especially uh, would be to make a connection between Route 4, maybe somewhere up around the golf course uh, into the area of uh, the 91 intersection. I know there's the old train bed, the gas line. Uh, you know, if you look at it, Google, you look at Google Earth and you look at the Route 91 intersection, and you can see a big wide strip and all it is, it's the power lines, it's the gas lines, and it's, and it's a complete, it would cut off all the traffic coming in directly through town. So I know what they talked about it before, and I know it probably is a lot of money, but I, to me, that's the only solution as far as the amount of traffic coming through town, that you can alleviate some of it. Um, <clears throat> the other issue is, safety in town and at the at the intersection of four and 236 i think it's primarily people coming from dover or rollinsford they're very impatient and they're, they're stopped at the intersection 
and they're trying to, they feel they have the right of way because there's no stop sign when you're coming from Rollinson and Dolby. You think you have the right of way all the way through the center of town. And so when there are people trying to come in from Kittery or Elliott from 236, they don't, they don't want to wait for them. They're, they're screaming at the people who have, they're yelling out the window, they're beeping their horn saying, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You know, we have the right of way. So there's a lot of uh, anger at that intersection and anger could, uh, it's not good, could cause accidents. So maybe a traffic light there. I don't think it's gonna move traffic through town any quicker. Just as my feelings that there was a traffic light in the center of town, I don't think it's going to help the flow, but I think it might be safer. So if we're thinking of safety, maybe we should think traffic lights. And if I think if we're just thinking the amount of traffic, the only way to beat that is a bypass. Thank you. Okay, so we'll get, yes, sir. <laughs> Sam Tibbetts live on Pine Street. Um, first of all, I don't envy any of you, but this is a very emotionally charged issue, obviously, which I think kind of goes into part of the problem that we're having, like we just explained. By the time you get to these intersections with mountain controls, people are out for blood. If you can get out of here, there's nobody not leaving rubber just to get out and turn left anywhere in this town. <laughs> I'm a fan of circles and it's not the most favorite uh, popular option, but any sort of traffic control at all would be helpful. Uh, the other thing you were talking about, the window being from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. to capture traffic. Um, for anybody on first shift shipyard, if they're not parked at 6 a.m., they're not getting to work on time. Probably 5, 5.30, that comes in here. So just keep that in mind. But that's all I got. Traffic control would be great. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Al. Al Breed, Elevate 13 Liberty Street. Um, I know there's one, you know, speed is definitely a problem. And on, on our street, we just got the calming bumps and you know the you know the possibility of you losing the front end of your car on the road is pretty good incentive in slowing people down. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? But I think the most one of the most important things we need to think about is is police presence. I mean, when you when you park a, a police car by the side of the road, people remember. You know, I think there's a little part of my brain that just remembers all the places I've seen cops. You know, I mean, it slows you down. And we have even gone to the police station and asked them to come and please park in our driveway, and it works. Um, and so I think just having some police presence. It seems to me sometimes in South Burwick. The lack of police presence is shocking. Um, you know, when I drive through Elliott, certain places, I I I go to speed limit. Um, I mean, I know that the they're paying attention, and in South Burke, I don't have that feeling uh, that the police are paying attention to speed. And I don't know if that's just allocation of manpower or or what it would be, but it seems to me that that's a pretty instant and you know useful way of slowing people down. Um, and the other thing I'd like to ask the, the traffic study people is, like, how difficult do you have to make it for someone to go through your town before they'll take another route? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're talking about either, so <laughs> we're talking about either speeding people up or slowing them down. Um, and it seems to me that if it's such a pain in the neck to go through South Berwick, people will find other ways to get to where they're going. I mean, it's, it's going to be painful. I mean, it's going to be painful for everybody, but um, it seems to me that if you make, if you allow people to go through town more quickly and smoother, more people are going to go, hey, you know, it's getting easier to get through South Berwick these days. I mean, it's going to, the volume's going to ramp up again. I, I don't know if you've, if you have any feedback on your data that tells you you know, what's, what's the real discouragement for people to go through a location? Yeah, I don't have any real data on that. It really depends on community and kind of what people are used to. Um, I will say variability in traffic delays are a big deterrent. So I heard a comment earlier, you know, if you go through an intersection, say between 7 and 7.30 in one day, it takes you 
five minutes and the next day it takes you 30 minutes that right. that variability can deter people away from certain corridors um a lot of what i've heard today and kind of the challenge ahead of us is there's a lot of competing interests here that i've heard tonight um traffic calming i've heard overwhelmingly um being a concern or introducing some traffic calming to the area um when you do that it's much more than just reducing the speed limit Changing the speed limit sign. If no one's following it today and we say that 35 mile per hour zone is going to be 25, well, guess what? They're not going to follow it tomorrow either. No. So it's making it uncomfortable for people to go above the speed limit. How do you do that? You narrow the streets, you provide curb extensions, you just make it very uncomfortable. Now, the competing interest of that is when you do that, you're taking pavement away, which decreases mobility through a corridor. So it becomes more difficult to get through. And I've also heard that people want to make their commute times quicker going through this corridor so that's the challenge um personally when i come into this i always i always defer to the side of safety first and foremost right. is we got to make these roads safer um uh, and the safer they become hopefully you're taking some traffic on the roads be off the roads i should say because people are feeling more comfortable walking rather than driving. yeah um but that is you, you know i certainly appreciate all the feedback we've heard thus far um, but that is the challenge is some of these are truly competing interests right. um, and, and just changing some signage around clearly is not going to get the job done. <laughs> That's why I'm, I say, you know, if there's a police car out there and it says 35, chances are most people are going to go 35. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, answer. enforcement's a big issue for sure. Yes. So you. on the, just, I want to touch on the enforcement issue because that, that has been uh, growing up in Elliott, you never want to go to Kittery. Right. Right? The skittery cops will give you a ticket for a mile an hour. Mm -hmm. That's how it was. Now, DTE, which is driving through Elliott, you can get a ticket on 236. That's where they hang out. That's where they always are every morning. They set my cruise control going through Elliott because yeah. they're there. Uh, we've had a change in the police department. We've had a change in direction. If you look at the town council meetings, Tim has been giving updates on the amount of traffic stops that Southburg PD has done and changed in the last three months. It's staggering the amount of traffic stops they're doing. I think it was well north of 180 yep. the last two week, wow. the last two week run. That's great. So <laughs> Chief Ruger has has really stepped up. The rest of the police force has stepped up behind him, and they are really hitting traffic people coming through town. Good. So hopefully we're going to hear everybody complaining now they're getting tickets. <laughs> <laughs> but they are they are they have increased unbelievable the amount of traffic stops they are doing that's, down no, that's good to hear. So, okay, we're still in the first round. Um, yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. My name is Dottie Levitt. We live out on Bell Marsh. We've only been out for about a year and a half because so we live closer to town. Um, the joke my husband and I have, though, when we come get closer to South Borough is we're now hitting South Boston. Yeah. Because it's, you know, there's, there's just way too much traffic and it's going too fast and all the things that other people have said. A suggestion I have, and I don't know if this is beyond the scope of, of this study, but we used to live down on Great Works Drive and our kids at that time used to have to cross 236 to get to the school mm -hmm. and has there ever been any consideration of a bridge to go from Pine Street over to Academy that would accommodate bicycles, would accommodate pedestrians. I mean, you really you can't get across 236 in a car. Right. Try getting across 236 right. walking or biking. It's it's starting to bring up an interesting point because I used to have great debates with the late Dennis Smith from town here and uh, we both on planning board together and I, I said to Dennis, I said, the, the track, the, the cure for the pedestrian vehicular traffic is to do exactly what you're talking about, only starting at the front lawn of this building and going across the central school. And it would never happen. It's a, it, but it's, it, it's, it's a germ of an idea, and perhaps it'll go that way. Um, but um, I, I was. was I think it was Alan was talking about things. I, I, I thought about Lewis Mumford. He was a great planner from the 1930s. And he, he, uh, he had a couple of really great quotes. And one of them was, uh, widening highways as a, as a cure for traffic congestion is the same as letting out our belt 
as a cure for obesity. I thought of it driving over the new Little Bay Bridge. It used to be one lane, too crowded. It went to two lanes, too crowded. And I'm approaching it, I see the three lanes, jammed. So um, there's a point where I think that there's some logic to increasing the level of uncomfortability uh, rather than expediency that there, there's a, a total throughput capacity that must be met. We have to come up with that in a rational way to understand what that is. And uh, at that point in time, people will perhaps find another way. And just one other thing, um, I do believe, and I use the blinking lights, like if I go to the post office and have to talk to this guy, I use the blinking lights. And a lot of cars stop, but some don't. And what I find myself doing is because there's a car parked hmm. right there by the crosswalk yeah. that you kind of lean, lean right. over and look. <laughs> so, and I know you don't want to do get rid of parking spaces on, on Main Street, but even that one parking space next to those blinking, so you don't have to, to lean over and look, I think would be helpful. And the other part about, well, you know, I understand businesses want parking access and it's important, but in the study, is there any way of saying how many of those people coming from the lakes on Sunday afternoon yeah. stop to get a piece of pizza or stop? Do that? Do do many of them stop in town? Is that in you know if you if you did away with some parking spaces, would it make any difference to business downtown? I don't know if you can study that. I don't, I don't know. Maybe have the businesses do a survey and say. You know, I don't recognize you. You coming from the lake, you know? But just you know, or you are not a towner, or whatever. You know, that type of thing. Because we, we don't know if it's impacting business or not. For sure. Mumford had another good one. He said, uh, <laughs> by allowing complete and unfettered access to the city core or the town core by vehicles, is the sure death of the downtown. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what we're facing, folks, you know? So who else is, is coming up here? Uh, hello, Sam Clinton from Creative Main. Uh, I just want to echo Dottie's thing about parking um, and adding it to the study, perhaps, so we have a more objective uh, point of view on the capacity and utilization of the parking. So that way, when a decision goes to be made to add or take away or but whatever it may be, there is some data to back up that decision. I think it'll help citizens along with that. And also my second one was, is there, does the traffic counts distinguish between traffic from Lower Main Street and continuing on to Berwick? Uh, yeah, do you want to well, Yonge Street, right? Yes. Yeah, we so do. they do. They go to Young Street, so that'll cover anything uh, lower, going. Lower Main Street's the last. All oh, lower, yeah, oh. sorry. Yeah. You're going to Rollins. Yeah, down towards uh, the Rollins for Bills, Bills versus in Berwick. Uh, yeah. I would suggest that, that be added if possible. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Gail Santos by Liberty Street. Uh, I was just wondering if in your discussions on this, there's any thought of public transportation. I mean, I know the Navy Yard has a commuter bus and they're looking at having more, they, they're going to add, I think, something like several thousand more jobs there. And they're already full up with parking and catering and on the day, so they're looking at having even more commuter busing. And I thought, God, I'd love to hop on that bus and just do that to Kittery and be able to do my shopping and come home with it. And but there's nothing for uh, you know residents. And I didn't know if uh, that may be beyond the scope of what you're looking at here. I don't know. Um, the other thing is, um, I I would like to see some of those uh, crossing lights down at the crosswalk on Park Street. I used to walk from Liberty up into town and around behind Sewell and, and then back again. That was like my, my walking route. And I haven't done that in the last couple of years because uh, in the last few years, I was nearly hit four times on trying to cross. And it was always cars coming from the center of town heading to Rollinsford. 
Um, and uh, thank you for the flashing speed uh, light that was put up down, down on the board down by uh, Liberty Street corner. I think that's helping. There's still some people that ignore it, but I found that if I walk up there to the corner and I stand there looking at how fast they're going and I look at them, <laughs> public humiliation helps. <laughs> Yeah. I just want to add a comment, um, and, and that is, and it's happened to me. Um, please, if, if you use any crosswalk, make sure we make eye contact with the operators because there's nothing, those flashing lights, all those lines on the road can do to make the vehicle stop. It takes the recognition by the operator to stop. So. Don't just jump it off the curb when the, when the lights stop flashing. That's, that's a, I've had some situations like that where they just didn't see me and, uh, and, whoop, and I didn't make eye contact. So please spread that with others that we may know who, who use the, the crosswalks in town. Thank you. Who's next? Uh, Paul Steinhauer from Hill Drive. Uh, when we moved here over 35 years ago, one of the many attributes that we liked about South Berwick was it has a centralized downtown. And we lived just behind the shoe shop and so we could walk downtown. It was great. There's some contradictions here and you, you've heard, you've addressed it, you've heard plenty. And my sensitivity is to the businesses downtown. I was hoping that we would hear some, from some business owners downtown here because we understand we have limited space downtown and parking is limited. But in order for us to try to remedy through traffic calming, islands, no left turn issues, we need the space. To get the space, we take the parking spaces and then the business owners will have an issue with that. So I follow a planner. It's his site is revitalize or die. And he's a planner and he looks at small towns like ours to try to revitalize the town. We are very fortunate right now that our storefronts are full, which is great. His philosophy that he says that he has seen so many times as towns like ours, when we are faced with this kind of issue is we want to make sure there's parking all over the place. And he said, that's not the correct approach. You need to have businesses that people will want to come to. And if they want to come to it bad enough or patronize it bad enough, they will find a place to park. So having said that and understanding that that concept has some merit, I think that if we did away with the parking spaces to try to assist us to remedy the situation we have, could be a potential. But if we did that, then we're leaving the question of where can we park? Well, we have some parking here. We have parking at the library at Young Street. There's some parking behind the school. But I would defer to the experts here to say, is that really enough parking spaces per business we have in town? So I think that there's a, there's a, a, a trade-off there. Uh, if we had that width, we could put a berm or something, an island down the middle, and that would sort of assist with some of the problems that I've seen like here at Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, you're in the Dunkin' Donuts drive-through, and for quite some time, there was a sign, no left turn. Then when they did the repaving and they redid Dunkin' Donuts, the sign went away, <coughs> and now the sign has come back up. Now signs are great, but they don't yell and they don't scream, so they can be ignored. And they are. And so when you're coming out of the Dunkin' Donut drive through and you're taking a left-hand turn, certain times of the day is fine, many times not so fine. If you had an island going down the whole strip, that answers your question. But again, that takes up space, which is derived from lack of parking. So like Tim said, he's not a, a planner or a, a highway expert, nor am I but just some observations in terms of what we can do, but also to, it's to, to uh, articulate the sensitivities of the businesses here in town. Don't wanna to drive them out 
That's what makes our town attractive, to have those businesses there and to allow them to flourish, but also understand that we have to have parking someplace and also the ADA component as well. Yeah, we can have parking within 500 yards away, but that may not be good enough. So I raise a bunch of questions. I don't have any answers, but I throw that on for fuel, fuel to the fire. Uh, my last comment is, having done significant driving through New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts, I know we're not the only small New England town that has this issue. <laughs> and it's not a cookie cutter approach because all the dynamics and the businesses and the streets are configured a little differently. So I'm hoping that in your history and other clients <coughs> you work with, that you may be able to pick and choose and perhaps take attributes from the successful projects and uh, apply them to help us out. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, Jack. My name is Mark Lawrence, and I'm here in a few different roles, and I wanted to give you a little perspective to and offer to myself as a resource on some of the background. In one way or another, I've been involved in traffic issues in downtown South Florida for about 40 years. Um, I've been a state representative for South Florida, Kittery and Elliott for six years, state senator for, I think it's 12 years now, if I'm lucky, four more. Um, I also am a business owner in downtown, and Paul had mentioned hearing from some of the business owners, and the parking is a concern, losing that parking out front is a concern. In a prior slide, you probably saw the light blue office space, that's mine, that's that law office, I represent 20, uh, lease 23 and 24 Main Street in between the cafe and the chiropractor. Um, I also, as an attorney, I represent the investment group that has bought the business block. Uh, Casco Bay Assets has bought that business block from 239 to 267, and I'm their authorized agent. They've also purchased some buildings behind on Scott's Court to get additional parking and things like that. And they are looking to do some investments in that building to restore the look of the building and improve the look of the building, improve the look of downtown. So they're very interested in their goal is to maintain a retail downtown. That's what they want to do, uh, maintain retail shops. And that's been the history of this downtown. Um, and one of the reasons why they invested in it, it's a very historical downtown. And I've been from seeing down, I grew up in Kittery. I've gone all the way up to Madawaska, all over New Hampshire. South Berwick is a very, very unique downtown. And whatever you do in your traffic plan, please don't destroy that downtown. It's a very easy thing to do. And I've seen it happen in other towns where traffic changes are made that destroy the character of the downtown. And this is a very unique downtown. If you understand the history of that block, um, the Sarah and Jewett house, the building that was saved behind it on Scott's Court, um, it's truly unique. Um, it's truly unique in, in, uh, in the state of Maine. Some of the challenges you're going to face, and I'll go first for to say why when I get done, I also, uh, in, in a, also being in the, having been in the legislature as a district attorney in New York County for eight years. So I prosecuted everything from speeding tickets all the way up to vehicular homicide. So I've seen a lot of different cases around, uh, around a lot of different situations around New York County. When I got done as DA, why I chose downtown South Berwick was because of its true uniqueness. I mean, if you look at the businesses downtown, there's literally one of every type of business. There's a pharmacy, a post office, you know, an, an engineering firm, a, a market. There used to be a laundry shop downtown. There's a florist. There's a red. There are now nine places to eat. It really hasn't changed that much. There's been a couple more added. Um, there's a chiropractor, there's an eyeglass shop, there used to be a vacuum cleaner shop downtown. None of those storefronts have stayed vacant for very long, uh, more than a couple of months because they're so sought after. It's such a great place. We now have a tattoo shop downtown. Uh, we have a marijuana place downtown. The downtown has changed uh, with the community. And when I first leased that space, my office is right at the intersection of 4 and 236. And I was told by the landlord that every day, 14,000 cars go through that intersection. 14,000 cars. And that was 16 years ago when I first rented it. 
And so he said, the front of your store is like a giant billboard. And I've never had to advertise. And I have more business than I can give. I've never had to advertise. That's very unique. And that's what's going to create difficulties for you is that unlike other downtowns, this is a major thoroughfare and that's not going to change. This intersection, I'm down there five to six days a week talking to people. I've directed people from Quebec and French on how to get to Concord who come through downtown South Berwick because they're going across Route 4 over to Concord. Um, you're never going to change that. It's not like Kittery where you can isolate a downtown or even Portsmouth where you can isolate it and you can have major traffic going outside. You're always going to have 236 and Route 4. And they're right, it is a feeder for... Um, for the shipyard and for all other kinds of businesses. I have clients who run bus lines for the shipyard down and they use the, the area here at the town hall to park and pick up people and drive them in. And they're subsidized by the federal government to do that as a way of decreasing traffic. Um, so the concerns of my clients are loss of that uh, space out front, that space to park for businesses. The other thing I'll tell you about the downtown is time of day downtown is very, very different. Mm -hmm. There are times you go downtown and it's dead. It's absolutely dead. And there are times you go downtown and just crazy. It's just crazy. And one of my fantasies, you know, you guys used to have Clint Shaw um, out there directing traffic. And one of my fantasies is the town of South Burrow will hire one of those police officers and put them in a fancy uniform with a whistle, you know, that does the acrobatics and directing traffic <laughs> and be there certain hours of the day and pay for it. And that would solve the traffic problem and, and also attract all kinds of attention to South Burrow. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but uh, that's just put it in the budget next year. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's just one of my fantasies. So, um, so that is a big concern. That's what I kind of wanted to relay on behalf of my clients and myself as a business owner downtown. I've talked to the other business owners. It's losing that on-street parking would make things very, very difficult. And you don't have the off-seat street parking in South Berwick that you would need to support a downtown. And I grew up in Kittery. I've watched what happened in Portsmouth spill over to Kittery. I've been watching what's happening in Dover. And believe me, it's coming over to South Berwick. In my Senate district, one of the unique things is we talked about population growth. It hasn't really grown that much in the last decade or so in population. But what's happening to this, my Senate district is it's gentrified. It's becoming older and wealthier and people are doing many more leisure activities like going out to restaurants, walking around downtowns and things like that. And I expect you'll see what's happening in downtown Dover spill over to South Burrick and South Burrick become kind of a food desert. Destination. So that's all I have to say. I uh, just offer you as a res uh, myself as a resource. And Jack, you talked about light poles downtown, and I also chair the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. So Joe Purrington from CMP is someone who hates to get calls from me. So if you ever have want to talk to anybody about the light poles downtown, don't don't hesitate to call me. I don't mind calling. <laughs> talking to uh, what's the best way to reach you? So if you look right at the front of my building, there's the office number 384-5105, or my cell is 475-4975. I also have a legislative and an office email, and I can drop a couple of cards by your office, but feel free to get in touch. I've talked to DOT so many times about the wide loads coming down. It's been going on for years and years, and I can tell you the history of the weights on the highway and and the polls and all that. So we'll follow up. We'll follow up. I'm happy to chat. Yeah, we'll yep. follow up with you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> David. I promise I'll be a great David Dagman, I uh, live on 45 Eagle Dam Road. I think of that traffic study in 87, I might have participated. Uh, <laughs> And things haven't changed very much, really, uh, since that time. I think the complaints about traffic were similar then, and I think they've been magnified now. And I don't think the traffic is going to get any less. I think it's going to get more. And I would echo the eloquent gentleman who said that we need a bypass. I, th I think wholeheartedly that, that transportation corridor, we plan for that to be preserved so that um, uh, Traffic could be diverted if it ever got too congested. And I think that time is long past. And 
Um, that would be very expensive for the state, I would understand, but it is a state road and I think it's their responsibility. And I think it's time the state steps up in that responsibility and allows us to have the town that we all want. Thank you. Great. Yes. Great. Linda. Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Becker. I'm one of the elderly neighbors. Um, <laughs> one of the elderly neighbors, a uh, retired teacher, and I had to laugh when someone was talking about staring or glaring at the people who are coming in, and you just want them to stop, and you can't believe they're not stopping. I'm sure my students would have loved me throw the finger, as I've been very tempted to do. Yeah. When you sit there for such an inordinate amount of time, you cannot believe that you can't get out of your own driveway. Excuse me. So what we've normally ended up doing, fortunately, we have a circular, circular drive, so we can go in. We don't have to go out that horrible way where you're facing the traffic. Um, you can be a few feet down, not many feet, but it's a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a um, distance between the people coming around the corner that you see. You know that old left, right, left again. If you don't do the second left, you're doomed. Um, what I really just want to say that has very little to do with parking spaces and widths of sidewalks is to bemoan the quality of life that is changing before our very eyes. We've been in South Berwick for 45 years and we raised our three children here. We love our house, we're too, it's too big for us now. We have to do something about that soon. Um, we want to downsize, but I just, I'm sort of thinking of an expression that my husband's grandmother, so you can imagine how long ago that was, said to his mother when Elvis Presley sang on the Ed Sullivan show. She folded her eyes and said, Elizabeth, I'm glad I'm on the way out. And <laughs> our children, when they, I know, she was a lovely woman, but she was not ready for Elvis, I fear. Um, but when our children come home from Seattle and from New Jersey, they shake their heads and say, Mom and Dad, how can you stand living here? They don't mean because the house isn't anything they remember and love because they do. They have very fond memories of South Berwick. But when they bring their grandchildren here, the grandchildren are the same. They're like, this traffic's just like New Jersey. Or this, you know, not quite as bad as the five lanes of Seattle. But I would just like to say that I would love to go with a bypass um, idea and keep it somewhere in the background of people's minds when they consider what we are going to do to maintain the quality of life that we've had. Um, my people that I taught with, my peers in Oyster River would say, oh, you live in South Berwick? You're so lucky, but what do you do with the traffic? I mean, that's the PS that you hear. It's a well-known fact. So thank you for doing this study. Thank you for whatever does happen that moves us toward safety. Um, I saw a, motor a motorcycle accident maybe three or four days ago because people get angry. It is the civility is gone. <laughs> there is no civility anymore. It's sort of a cultural thing that's happened nationwide, I fear. But I, the danger is there. We need to work on the danger. But I want to just say what we have is something we cherish, and that's our time. So, thank you. For well, those of you who laugh, I just um, I want to kind of jump off of. Linda's statement. So sitting here with me tonight is our new economic community developer who's come on board. Um, because one of the things that I recognize and I, the council recognizes and my staff recognizes, if we don't capture the, the way of life in South Berwick and the quality of life. And it's in exactly what uh, Mark was talking about, Dover and Summersworth and Berwick and Sanford and Kittery, it's coming here. And if we ignore it and we don't do anything with it, it'll overrun us. And then your kids won't come back. Where'd you go? Your kids won't come back because they're gonna say it is too bad. And you folks are gonna say, how come we didn't do something about this? So a couple things that don't really pertain to this tonight, but pertain to what we're talking about. The traffic study is phase one, okay? Phase two is to get some businesses in town to help lower the tax taxes as we can. But number three is whether we get new businesses, new roads, new traffic, 
we have to start working in every day in the forefront of our mind, be it that the quality of life in South Borough has to be maintained through the character of our community. And if we don't do that and keep that in the forefront now through the comprehensive plan updates, through traffic review, traffic studies, traffic improvement, downtown revitalization, whatever it is, it's going to come here and it's going to overrun us. So me and my staff commit to the citizens of South Berwick. We're here to make sure that we try to capture, as long as we're here and the council, the quality of life to keep what you have here. We recognize what that is. That's what this is all about. It's not just the traffic study. There's many other components to this that you don't see behind the scenes. What we're trying to do is capture and maintain a good quality of life and make it better. If we don't do something, then nothing will happen. So just so you know, thank you. Audrey Audia Rodeo Road. I promise to be brief. I was not going to say anything, but there were three comments here that triggered consideration. <clears throat> and they had to do with attitude when people are driving. Um, Kenny Buck earlier in the summer came up. Now it sounds kind of, you know, it's it's not a traffic light, it's not cops. It's very simple. They came out with a bunch of signs, road signs, and it wasn't political season. So you kind of noticed them and it was slow down Kenny Buck. And on those back roads, I think people get in a, they're on 236, they're coming home from work, they got a state of mind. And I've tried crossing the street and there's places I go where I carry my umbrella, my red, white and blue umbrella, you can't miss me crossing the street. And when they do confront, I stop, I was a letter carrier, you had to confront like, you start, you, point, you got to address back at the drivers. I think some of them are rude, especially the New Hampshire drivers. <laughs> well, they, they've surpassed the Massachusetts drivers when it comes to rudeness on the road. But I think some of them are in a trance because I was with my grandson coming home from school. This is in North Road, not South Road. I take my umbrella there too. <laughs> Crossing the road on the crosswalk. He's a big boy. You can't, you can't miss the two of us. And the car just kept coming. And I know enough not to get close enough to get hit. So as he went by, I clumped him with my umbrella. <laughs> it's like he was asleep. And I wonder if something as simple, not as simple as just signs, but maybe there would be a safety brigade in town, like the flag brigade that took over. Maybe if you got some somebody, it had it would have to be in conjunction with the police department because there are liabilities. The people with some signs, some little kids standing at where all the political signs are now, down by Cumberland Farms on the island, reminding these people when they come home from the Navy, you're in someone's neighborhood here. I have to do it out on Rodeo Road. They get this couple of straightaways on Rodeo Road. They get zipping up there. If I'm getting my mail, I step out and I give them the, I give them the finger this way. <laughs> but really, there's a state of mind, and I don't. I think sometimes it's not intentional, but I think the younger ones think they're playing video games, and you're in the way, and they can. They don't. You know it when you're on the main turnpike, and the, they cut you off at 70 miles an hour. The laws of physics aren't working up here. And I think it's going to take more than traffic lights. I think it's going to be something the citizens who are concerned about this have to be a little assertive too. When you cross the road where the cars come up, don't step back, stand your ground and let them see you. Push back. Yes, sir. Bring your umbrella. <laughs> John Costello, Boyd's Corner. A few questions. Uh, one for the traffic study. Have we taken into consideration or looked at the traffic in the morning that's actually being created by parents trying to get their kids to schools? That is something that we will look at. Then that's why we took data at the school access points to take that into consideration. Okay. I think that's clearly a big problem with congestion in the morning and afternoons picking kids up when we clearly need to maybe 
send the message out that put your kids on the bus. That's why they're there. That's why we pay for them. Uh, the other thing is, is we've clearly been trying to battle this traffic issue for many, many years. I think a lot of people in this room for a long time. I think that we need to get past that. We're in with centrally, lo centrally located uh, next to all kinds of towns where people, there's no stopping it. There really isn't. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. I think what we really need to do is downtown is have more of a police presence. I mean, let's be honest. There's probably not one person in the other one that they may be going a little bit fast. They see a police officer, it's gut wrenching. It can be at times. <laughs> Put that fear into people. And I think that anything that we do, we also need to take into consideration with the traffic study. If there is any major changes done downtown, and we've taken snow removal into consideration because that's very difficult in finding places to put small snow in a congested little town. So that's the other thing. That was fine. Thank you. Thank you. Looking around. I think we completed round one. <laughs> really? Okay, that's uh, an hour and 40 minutes. Does anybody have a follow up? Put. Oh, 30 Pence Plains Hill, sixth generation South Road, 78 years old. Former town councilor back in the uh, well, late 80s, early 90s, town council, with the guys of Will Club, went to Augusta, begging to try to get some kind of a bypass. We got nowhere. It was an uh, environmentally thing here and obstacles there, no goal. Because South Berwick is the gateway to Western Maine. There's very little we can do about it. If a roadway could be put in, Town without disturbing too much parking, <clears throat> maybe that would be the answer better than the light. And I guess uh, we do have a uh, park and ride on the lot here. And I guess that's about it. Thanks, but anybody else on a follow up that things that haven't been discussed or amplified? Yes, sir. Got a question about parking. Got a question about, yeah, talking about parking is how many parking spaces are there in the downtown area between like say Young Street to Central School? We we did a parking study back in 2015. I do not have that total number, but we, we do have which is 485. 485 was eliminated at some of the safety reasons that were not in compliance with right. DOT traffic standards. So last time we checked, it was around 400, 485. It's a little bit further than what you're just talking about. That goes to it, Railroad yeah. Ave. Okay. And now, how, how many parking spaces are there in the lot on Paul Street? 10. 10? There's 10 over there. Yep. I, know, I know there's some at the post office, and there's some on Nolan Street. Some here. I was wondering how many other parking spaces the, the town had. I know people want to stop and park right in front. And if you go to Walmart, most people like go to the grocery store, you want to park as close as you can, but people are not really lazy. So uh, I was just wondering how many other parking spaces there were in town. Yes, sir. Robert Levins again. I, I neglected to say that I live on Witch Trap Road uh, on the Emmerich Bridge. And um, in hearing about roundabouts, I'm completely concerned about that idea. Um, in thinking about the roundabout in Stanford that's terrible. on Route 4, that's about as small a roundabout that would do the traffic that is there. And it's a nightmare in my opinion. And anything smaller than that here, like the roundabout in Newburyport by the chain bridge is totally unnavigable for a truck or removing snow. Now, a roundabout moving snow in the winter here at the intersection of Route 4 and 236, 
would be impossible. It would be a traffic jam for a day and a half. Thank you. You're right. Julie. Just a few thoughts um, as people were talking. Um, one of them is the Norton Just Street. Name. Oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, Julie Manili, 175 Portland Street. Um, speaking to the um, Norton Street and the backup there, we've got our fire station right there. I've been one that's gone to use that little getaway around and it's backed up way beyond the fire station. So I see that as a great situation of concern. Um, and just in regards to Linda speaking about just the quality of life, um, if we could you know, curb speeding and, and calm the traffic, I might be able to talk to Mary, my neighbor, in the front of our yards and hear her. I might not have my almost three-year-old grandson running around the yard like this because of the truck noise that's going by. So, you know, it does, it's the little things that do impact our comfort and our enjoyment. And thank you for getting this team on board and thank you guys. You do one more. Push an envelope. Yeah. <laughs> is it something different? Uh, it is different. Okay, great. Uh, from Clary, Tense Place Hill. When I was a teenager, I had a lead foot. And I probably still do. But is it possible for in town streets and even Main Street to be reduced to 15 miles an hour and somehow, like I said, blue lights around once in a while? I mean, all, all, all the speed limits are set by the I know, state. but they're set by the state. They, they will not lower a state road any lower than 25 miles an hour. Really? We've asked. It's, that's that's it on the state road is 25. How about our side streets? There's some pretty heavy going on on side streets. I got a 25 mile an hour sign that's, in front of my house. That's ridiculous. And, and to drive 25 <laughs> from young to parent to Sewell Road, you have to be on two wheels to make it 25 miles an hour. It, it's, it's nuts. I agree with you. Well, I guess people just aren't uh, you know, where it is, but my daughter was getting her driver's license, the speed limit is 25 miles an hour. So we're coming up into town, and if Kathy, oh, I'm doing 25. You see people around here, see vehicles, slow down. All right, I want to thank you all very much. Uh, are there any uh, comments from consultants that you'd like to make to close out here? No, not at this time. We really appreciate the feedback. Um, certainly what we were looking for to get started, um, and hopefully we have something that's meaningful for all of you. Um, we. The challenge is not lost on us, you know, the, you know, what you guys are, are bringing to us or bringing to the table. Um, like I said, certainly is not lost on us, um, but we're going to do our best to try to meet all the needs of all the roadway users here and see what we can come up with. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. Uh, Councilors, any, any comments or closing comments? I just have comments. Um, I, it would be interesting if there are any statistics about um, the speed of traffic or the rate of traffic and how we can try and lower emissions with any type of, I don't know, like, what's the stop, you know, what are different solutions created based on? So we, we do have that ability to model emissions, um, mostly at intersections is how we would do that, um, and it comes down to idle time, really. Um, so some of our simulation software that we use, like when we compare an unsignalized intersection to a traffic signal to a roundabout, um, that has the ability to estimate what the delays are and in turn estimate what the emissions are. But it's only a model, um, but that certainly is an output that we could look at. Um, and again, it's only as good as the data going into it, obviously, but yeah, that is possible. I'm good, Jeff. Uh, I think, um, I think there are a lot of great things that, in my mind, I, I'd, I'd like to see uh, <coughs> uh, a thorough look at the flow. I think that there are some good ideas about um, one ways and things like that that might provide some options as well as, you know, then adjusting parking and stuff like that. So um, the flow is where I think we have the most ability to uh, impact. So. Thank you. Okay, just uh, quickly, um, just I heard the comments about busing. If there's if, uh, bus stops that are in the downtown area, if those could be captured. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Tim, do you have anything to close out on your end? I do not. Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. There's uh, been a lot of meaningful commentary here tonight and, uh, and a great perspective uh, offered. And uh, so thank you very much. I'm sure the consultants will, uh, will take it to heart. And thank you. It'll, 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 it'll definitely improve the, uh, the product. So thank you all very much for coming out. Thank you too.